Hey folks, how you doing? Don Grant, CTC Cutting Tool Counselor, here with another, oh, of course I'm going to say exciting episode of In The Loop TV, uh, continuing on ball nose end mills. We talked about surfacing, ball nose end mills, how to get the most out of a ball nose end mills in your 3D surfacing application. We're going to continue on this episode, but before I get started, please subscribe, like, share, all that other good stuff. Would really appreciate it before we jump into this episode. No, I'm waiting. Go ahead. Like, subscribe. I'll hold on. Just get it done. No, I'm kidding. Do it on your own time. It's fine. Thanks for coming back. Ball nose end mills, continuation. We talked about scallop height. We talked about effective diameter. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about chip thinning with a ball nose end mill, and we're also going to talk about four flute ball nose end mills that have two flutes to center are all those flutes cutting when you're surfacing? That depends. We're going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it right now. We're going to talk about it next. Well, thanks for coming back in the loopies. That's what I'm calling everybody now, in the loopies. Thanks for coming back and watching this episode on ball nose end mills. We're continuing the saga on ball nose end mills when it comes to surfacing. I am really stressing the point when it comes to surfacing because let's be honest, you can use a ball nose end mill for full slotting. You can use a ball nose end mills for traditional roughing. You can also use a ball nose end mill for finishing. Those are standard applications, standard tool paths. Not really concerned about that. We're trying to understand how to use a ball nose end mill to get the best surface finish that we possibly can. So this episode, we're gonna talk about chip thinning with a ball nose end mill. Chip thinning, how do we adjust for chip thinning? And what is it about a ball nose end mill when we're surfacing that causes chip thinning? We're also gonna talk about briefly when you're running a four flute ball nose end mill or a six flute or some three flutes, are all of those teeth cutting? I know that sounds a little bit weird, but you're gonna wanna stay and come back for this one because that's a pretty interesting topic. So please, we can't talk about it here. Where are we gonna go? We're gonna run to the shop and we're gonna talk about it next. Well, hey, 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 we are in the shop and we are talking ball nose end mills or mainly 3D surfacing. That's been the topic of everything. So when we're talking about 3D surfacing with a ball nose end mill, and trust me, folks, there's probably one more episode on ball nose end mills going to wrap this whole thing up and then we're going to get into something really cool. So in, in continuing the saga on ball nose end mills, we're going to talk about something called chip thinning. Now, I did do an episode before on chip th thinning on standard end mills, which is on the radial side. You can go back and watch that one. Maybe somebody uh, can put a link somewhere. You can click on that one if you want. But when we're 3D surfacing with a ball nose end mill, there is chip thinning on the bottom of that tool. And there's one really easy way that I can explain how chip thinning works with a ball nose end mill. So the best way to explain chip thinning, in my opinion, with a ball nose end mill, is using something called a face mill. Let's just think about a face mill. There's a lot of different types of face mills. They look like this. A face mill has something called a lead angle, right? It has a lead angle on the end of that face mill. You can get them at 45 degrees. You can get them at 30 degrees. You can even do some high feed facing where they lay down even 6, 10, 12 degrees. That lead angle, which is on the end of the tool right here, lays down. As that lead angle starts to lay down, hey, uh, just pay attention to this picture over here. I got a ball nose over there. Don't. It's going to come into play a little bit later, but let's, let's stay on this side. As that lead angle starts to lay down, as we're feeding that lead angle into the material, the chip is getting thinner. The chip is getting thinner. The more that lead angle lays down, the chip gets thinner. You can kind of see from the diagram here how that lays out. So we kind of have to take that face mill and we get to feed it a little bit faster. 
kind of similar to chip thinning on the side of an end mill. Now, if you take a look at this tool and we're talking about lead angle, as that lead angle actually starts falling down and getting lower, you see that? Now, put your attention over on this ball nose. You see something on the end of a ball nose that looks really similar to a lead angle on a face mill? Yes, we have a radius on the bottom of it, but look at how that starts to lay down the closer we get to the bottom. Now we're talking about surfacing, right? And when we talk about surfacing, we talked about the first episode on scallopite, and we're trying to get the best finish possible. And in order to do that, our axial depths are very light. They're not aggressive. We're not using the side of that ball nose. We are using the bottom of that. So now our lead angle, if you look at that ball nose, the lead angle on the bottom is starting to roll down, in which case, when we're feeding that with light axial depths with a ball nose, our chip is getting thinner, thinner. So if we program two thou right here on the OD and we go to the bottom, that chip could be in the tenths. That's how small that chip can go. So here's the beauty. If we're actually taking a small axial depth and we're also taking small radial depths, we already know that from the other videos, and that chip is getting thinner, we can feed it faster. This is why when you're using a ball nose, there are a lot of tool path in order to get the finish you want. But some of the benefits is that we have chip thinning going on, right? We have chip thinning so we can feed that ball nose a lot faster than we think we can based on a standard chip load. So now let's just step back just a wee bit to the last episode. Remember when I talked about effective diameter and I said as the effective diameter gets smaller because we're taking a small surface, okay, we get to increase our RPM because everything's divided by the diameter and effective diameter is smaller. So now we're increasing the RPM with a ball nose because we can generate that heat at the cutting edge with a higher RPM and we're getting chip thinning so we can have a higher RPM, we can feed it faster. So when you're surfacing, don't get scared that you're taking very light axial and radial step overs that it might take a while. Don't get me wrong, it does take a while but we can feed it a lot faster. So don't be afraid to get a little bit more aggressive with your ball nose as far as your chip load goes, as far as your RPM goes, and how fast you can feed it. So in a nutshell, that's chip thinning on a ball nose. It's an angle. So depending on where we're at with that radius and how deep we're going, that angle changes as that lead angle, like I said, with an indexable cutter, as that lead angle starts rolling down, the chip starts getting thinner and then we need to adjust for that. Now, what's the formula to adjust for that? I'm gonna make it easy on you again. Please go to the Machining Advisor Pro. It's a free download. Download the Machining Advisor Pro and it calculates for chip thinning on a ball nose end mill. As a matter of fact, you put a ball nose end mill in there, it knows that you're going to be doing surfacing and it makes your calculation on your effective diameter and your chip thinning so you get the benefits of the feed out of that. That's the easiest way to do it. That's chip thinning. That's how chip thinning works on a ball nose end mill. Okay, so I said at the beginning of this episode, I wanted to talk about a four flute ball nose end mill, just a standard four flute ball nose end mill and how they work. And if we are surfacing with a four flute ball nose end mill, are we getting all four flutes that are cutting effectively? So first let's look at a ball nose end mill. I got some simulations from our engineering team uh, through our tool studio that we use for our calculating things. Let's take a look at a ball nose end mill, four flute ball nose end mill. Most four flute ball nose, nose end mills, and I say most, at least ours are, I can't speak for everybody, have two teeth that are cut all the way to center, okay? Now in order to get those two teeth to cut all the way to center, we have to gash in between those two teeth to get them to cut all the way to center. So even though it is a four flute ball nose, you can see the other two teeth that run opposite 
okay, the two teeth that are cut to center are cut back. It's the only way you can gash it. It's the only way you can get two teeth to cut to center. You have to cut them back. When you cut those teeth back like that, okay, there is, and this is an example on a half inch end mill, there is a 15 thou gap from the two teeth to center to the flutes that are cut back. Now, why is that important? Well, everything that I've been talking about on these last three episodes, and this is a great segue, so I um, hope everybody's paying attention. Everything I've been talking about literally on these last three episodes is basically using a ball nose end mill in a three axis mill, X, Y, and Z, three axis mill. So we're on the end of that tool and we're using the tip of that tool. So if we're using the tip of that tool and we are doing surfacing and in surfacing, it's not uncommon to drop that thing down four, five thou in axial. And if we drop that thing less than 15 thou, how many teeth are cutting? Two. There's two teeth cutting. So be mindful. If your axial depth in a three axis machine does not exceed the two teeth that are cut short, you are essentially, essentially, you are actually cutting with two teeth. So you might need to make some adjustments for that. So how do we fix that? Segway time. How do we fix that for the last episode? We are now going to talk about taking a ball nose end mill and using it in a five axis machine. And we're going to tilt that tool on its axes in a five axis. And we're going to program the side of the end mill. So we're going to take effective diameter a little bit more out of the equation. We're going to get all effective flutes to cut efficiently. And we're going to be able to use that ball nose a lot more effectively. Hopefully that makes sense, but that's a little teaser. Come back for the last episode on ball nose end mills where we try and make them a lot more efficient by using them in a five axis machine. So does that mean you can't use them in a three axis machine? No, just be mindful of effective diameter. Be mindful of chip thinning on the radius, which still works in a five axis. And be mindful that two teeth on a four flute ball nose are cut back beyond. So if you're just using the tip of that tool, you might not be cutting with all four flutes unless you tilt the tool on its side. This is really important when you get into six flutes. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, hey, hey, hey folks, thanks for coming back. Thanks for joining me on this episode. What an episode this was. We talked about ball nose end mills. We talked about chip thinning. Very common. Chip thinning is all over cutting tools. It really is. The better you understand chip thinning, even with ball nose and with standard end mills, the better you're going to be able to program your machines. We talked about chip thinning with a ball nose end mill. We also talked about effective teeth in your cut on a ball nose end mill in three axes. Next episode, we're putting all this together. We're going to close this one out on ball nose end mills. We're going to tilt. I said pivot. We're going to tilt. We're going to tilt that tool on its axis. We're going to use the side of that tool. Might even throw in some programming tips, show you how to use that in a five axis machine and run to the next one. So thanks for joining me. I appreciate you coming back. I appreciate you watching these episodes. And boy, do I appreciate you liking, subscribing and sharing these videos. But before I go, we all know there's three guarantees in life, death, taxes, and spring passes. Have a great rest of your week, folks.